Hey folks, Matt Hinckley here with Cressy Sports Performance. Um, we've had a lot of inquiries as of late regarding Thea Markerless motion capture and, and Cressy Sports Performance and what exactly these reports entail. So I figured it'd be worthwhile to spend a little bit of time going over exactly what one could expect to receive from these reports. Um, just as a preface here, before any of this data is collected, we set up an eight camera setup right out on the baseball field. There's zero markers involved, hence the name Thea Markerless. Um, athletes simply throw a bullpen. We, we ask that the athletes are built up relatively well, so we make sure that these are relatively high effort, I mean 95% and above effort fastballs. Um, some of our older demographics, we will dive into biomechanics when it comes to their entire arsenal. So we'll collect you know, five fastballs, five sliders, five change-ups, five curveballs, whatever they have in their mix um, to make sure that biomechanically we're seeing some consistencies when it comes to the way that they execute the pitches or honestly diving into some of the risk kinematics. That's that's a little bit um, more in the weeds than what we're going to cover today. The athlete involved in this report is actually a high schooler from Texas. Um, figured it'd be worthwhile to kind of go over the X's and O's of, of exactly what we're doing with these reports and um, at least giving a general overview. So first thing we do when we sit the athletes down is we go over a quick summary um, we highlight things kinematically that they, they're either doing well currently. Um, we talk about some things that may need improvement. So in this athlete's case, his hip shoulder separation was something that we felt, um, based on his range of motion potential, could have vastly improved. You can notice here, 11.6 degrees of hip shoulder separation. Um, his torso rotation at foot flat is relatively low as well. So something that is... Uh, it's very unique to Cressy Sports Performance and something that we feel is is a difference maker when it comes to the client experience when they come down here is the fact that our, our strength and conditioning staff and our pitching staff and our hitting staff, everybody integrates at a very high level. Um, a lot of this starts with actually our strength and conditioning staff. So before we work with pitchers, whether that be somebody that comes to us for monthly training or something that comes to us, somebody that comes to us for more of a one time consult or a Thea report like what we're covering today. Um, they start with an initial evaluation. We've, over the years, we've compiled a lot of this, this data that we collect to try to track trends when it comes to high level movers. So essentially every athlete that walks through our door goes through a, a series of passive range of motion screens, um, active range of motion screens, power testing, so on and so forth. And, and what we've done is we've we've then been able to um, draw comparisons based on the way guys move. And this is something that we feel is is very, very important. Uh, in short, all I'm saying is if, if, if I'm going to ask somebody to do something with their delivery, I, I better make sure first and foremost that they have the requisite range of motion to get into the positions I'm asking them to get into. Um, and if they're, if they're trying to use range of motion that they don't possess, um, that's when we see things like erratic command, erratic velocity, so on and so forth. So cool thing is, is, when we're evaluating guys, there's no right or wrong. We've got athletes that um, look significantly different. We've got athletes in the major leagues that we work with that are relatively stiff in, stiff in their upper bodies. We've got athletes that we work with that are stiff in their lower bodies. We've got guys that are loose everywhere when it comes to range of motion. Um, that's the cool thing about baseball is, is there's a lot of ways to skin it. There's a lot of ways to move. Um, it's It's kind of contrary to the whole ideals of you know, one mechanical model being optimal. Um, if you've if you've screened athletes for any extent of time, you can appreciate that everybody's built different, and we believe that it's a value to embrace those differences as opposed to trying to correct or run away from from anything they do that might stray from the norm. So, in this in this athlete's case, I want to highlight the fact that he's a narrow infrasternal angle guy, and when we evaluate narrow infrasternal angles. We'll, what we expect is a, is a lot of uh, rotation capacity. So as in this athlete's case, you can see that he's got a lot of um, external rotation in his hips, a lot of external rotation in his shoulders, and a relatively high amount of like thoracic rotation ability. A little bit of a difference between his active and passive range of motion, which is something that we can work to improve. Um, but in general, when we when we see guys that are narrow in external angles, we we expect to see a lot of rotation. Um, this athlete currently, with the way he, he uses his delivery, is not optimizing this potential, and that's what we're going to cover um, as we move forward here. 
He's got a lot of range of motion in his shoulders. So 135 degrees passively um, is, is quite a bit of, of external rotation. And when you're evaluating the colors on the left-hand side here, I should have said this as a preface. Um, if you see red, think small range of motion. If you see green, think large range of motion. So a lot of uh, upper body IR, a lot of upper body ER, plenty of shoulder flexion. Um, when, we, when you see zero when it comes to elbow extension, just try to picture in your head the athlete's arm completely straight. If you see anything positive, you can appreciate that their arm would go past 180. Um, so in this, in this athlete's case, a little bit of stiffness in his lower body, which is probably protective tension. That's something that we're going to cover here in a little bit. Plenty of uh, upper body range of motion. Um, what's interesting, and we kind of highlight this right here, is he's relatively limited in hip abduction which is essentially his, his groin length uh, passively on the table. Yet he ranks really high in our data set as far as his stride length is concerned. So it's something that we've, we found to be interesting. Um, in our experience, using the range of motion that you have, so in this athlete's case, external rotation in his hips, external rotation, external rotation in his shoulders, a lot of thoracic rotation, relatively good ankle mobility is, is generally a good thing. Um, trying to chase big positions and ranges that are passively limited is a is a recipe for disaster in our experience. So. so after we spend a little bit of time covering um, the, the potential of what an athlete might be able to do based on their range of motion um, with their initial evaluation, we work really hard to find um, high level movers that are relatively good comps from a range of motion standpoint. So this top athlete is a, an actual major league pitcher um, that is very, very similar when it comes to his his movement capacity um, based on his range of motion. So every athlete that, that walks through the doors at CSP goes through this eval process. And then what we are able to do um, is, is draw comparisons. And we built out some tools that allow us to do this in the background. Um, but we're able to draw comparisons based on the different ranges of motion for each joint to try to drum up a, a good comparison for the athlete. Because if I'm going to if I'm going to give somebody a, um, a movement comp, I first and foremost should make sure that the, the range of motion potential matches um, the top eval. Um, I'd, ar I'd actually argue is a little bit stiffer, has a little bit less rotation potential, but rotates at a relatively high level. Um, he's a major leaguer that throws in the mid 90s. This bottom eval is a high schooler that's flirting with 80 miles an hour right now. Um, we're hoping that after some time, following the the recommendations that we we provide at the end of this this Thea report, he's going to find his way um, into the mid 80s and beyond as he as he progresses in age and strength and so on and so forth. So, but if you can appreciate relatively similar amounts of passive T-spine rotation. Um, both of them biased external rotation as opposed to internal rotation, especially in the lower half. Um, so we're looking at the lower halves here. We've got a guy that has an ER bias is what we would call it. We've got obviously that the athlete that we're covering in this report we've already discussed has a very, very ER biased um, body. Um, if you go, if we get pretty granular, you, if you're splitting hairs, we can talk about, okay, like this athlete has a ton of ankle mobility. This athlete doesn't. Um, there's, there's something to be said for the individual differences. And when we throw these comps out, we're, we're very, very adamant that like, Hey, we're, we're looking at trends here. I don't need you to copy every single inch of what this athlete's doing. I want you to take away more of a, a macro or bird's eye view as to what this athlete is doing to, to generate velocity and, and stay on the field and be healthy and all those other things. So. After spending some time talking about the actual physical evaluations and the passive range of motion potential, um, we immediately dive into the actual biomechanics when it comes to um, the way that athletes move and and we try to give the athlete that we're sitting down with a, a picture of the actual objectives that we're going to chase. So the top um, GIF that you can see there, GIF, GIF, you guys tell me, I don't, I don't really know which one it is, but I'm going to commit to GIF. Um, this is the major league pitcher that it's in the mid nineties. Um, this is the high schooler that is, that is currently flirting with 80 miles an hour. And, um, we, we try to cover the big, big heavy hitters. Like I said, um, the previous slide, it's, it's less about trying to create an exact replica of the athlete above 
it's more about looking at overall principles and, and, and trying to understand, um, okay, this athlete has a lot of external rotation. This athlete has the ability to rotate through his T-spine. He's tapping into this potential. This athlete has a lot of external rotation in his hips, a lot of thoracic rotation ability, and he's, he's not using um, very much of that potential currently. Now, then we have to peel the layers back and go, okay, is this a, is this a strength issue? Is this something that's neurally just been programmed to him? Has he been working with a coach previously that's just drilled in a very linear move um, into this pitcher's head over the years? Um, it's, it's, it comes down to asking very pointed questions at that point. Um, that's why it's, it's, we feel it's, it's relatively negligent to just stare at the biomechanics and, and dive right into interventions without understanding all of the context involved. Um, but if we're looking at the actual deliveries, you can notice that big league athlete does a really good job of holding a relatively vertical shin. That's something we see with the ER bias pitchers relatively frequently. You can notice that this pitcher is using his, his right leg as a counterbalance, which is expressed by him straightening that knee out and kind of sweep, sweeping it out a little bit more of like a swinging gait with that front side. That's something we see with our ER bias guys relatively frequently. And if you can appreciate with the way that this right glove reaches towards first base from a direction standpoint, he's tapping into some counter rotation in his thoracic spine, which would encourage the, the athlete to tap into the, the rotational capacity that he has. If we're diving down here, this is the athlete that, that came to us for the report. Really, really linear takeaway in his upper half, um, instantly falling into hip internal rotation. So you'll notice this knee is essentially going forward straight away not really holding that knee over the rubber as well as we think he could. Um, he's diving into a ton of internal rotation in his front hip, which is expressed by um, the amount of flexion that you can see in that front knee. So those are the big things that jumped off the page at us. And if we toggle back here relatively quickly, you can appreciate this athlete um, in the bottom GIF is, is using a ton of hip internal rotation, specifically in his left hip. And that's where one of his major limitations is. So he's trying to use a strategy and a, an amount of range of motion that he's not necessarily um, got a high amount of potential for. So we feel that this is negatively impacting his ability to throw the baseball hard. Now, this would come as, as relatively common sense, and this is probably something that you guys are listening to this saying, okay, this guy worked at Cressy Sports Performance there. Jim, of course he thinks that somebody needs to get stronger. Um, when it comes to to asking athletes to express range of motion that they have passively. We feel that, and this is something that we, we feel relatively confident in, is that if, if somebody has passive range of motion and they don't have strength, they don't have motor control, then they have instability. So our, our jobs and our strength coaches' jobs is to um, understand the, the athlete's range of motion potential, understand their deficiencies, and create strength throughout the entire arc of range of motion. Um, this athlete is like we could sit here and, and give him mechanical interventions till we're blue in the face. But if he doesn't have the requisite strength to control the positions we're asking him to get into, um, you're going to see a very unstable delivery. You're going to see somebody that doesn't repeat their delivery very well um, and somebody that's less adaptable when it comes to adjusting to a hole in the mound, adjusting to um, mound height differences, um, so on and so forth. So. This athlete, it's, it's relatively common sense when we're dealing with a high school age kid. Most high school kids need to get stronger. Um, however, um, single leg strength, rotational power, um, drills that encourage sequencing. This could be a medicine ball variation, which we'll cover with the recommendations tab as we move forward here. Um, we feel need to be major focal points in this athlete's training. Um, again, I want to reiterate range of motion without motor control, which essentially means strength throughout the entire range of motion is instability. Instability can set an athlete up for poor performance, injury, so on and so forth. So we'd like to avoid that if at all possible. The second objective that uh, we want to cover with this athlete, and this is something that we, we, we spend a lot of time when it comes to motion capture. We cover positions, we cover kinematic sequencing, and we cover uh, velocities expressed. Um, this slide is dedicated to all the angles involved. So think positions here. So very similar to our, our actual passive range of motion screen. When you see green, think large range of motion. When you see red, think small range of motion. Um, it's actually interesting here. And that linear move that we've kind of been alluding to that the athlete is currently making 
is expressed by his high amount of forward lean. So FF meaning foot flat, MER meaning max external rotation, BR meaning ball release. As you can see, he, he ranks relatively high in our data set um, for forward lean velocity, which is a or forward lean angles. I'm sorry, not velocities. Um, but essentially, this is, this is alluding to the fact that he's just kind of falling down the mound. When we look at torso rotation, the, the ranges are actually relatively small. Um, which, based on his passive range of motion, we would expect those to be a little bit higher. Um, same could be said for the pelvis. Same could be said for, for the hip angles as well. Um, really small ranges in his hips, his pelvis, and his torso, um, aside from just falling forward. So this is something that, objectively, we know that this athlete is currently just falling down the mound um, based on where he's currently ranking in our data set. Um, relatively... Uh, Relatively small amount of rotation taking place from an angle standpoint. That's something that we feel we can address. So the third objective that we want to cover here is that the actual velocities involved. So everything on this page that you can see above um, is an actual velocity measure in degrees per second. Um, same could be said based on the ranges. So if you see green, think fast. If you see red, think small. If you see yellows and reds and oranges, um, I'm sorry. If you see yellows and oranges, think more moderate um, velocities. So in this athlete's case, when it comes to his torso, his pelvis, um, even his shoulder, that relatively low scoring and or relatively low ranking in velocities. And this is due to the, the aforementioned positions that he's been putting himself into. Um, this knee flexion extension um, velocity is essentially like more of a traditional block. So you can think of somebody landing on a flex leg and then extending it quickly. Um, he's ranking really high. Um, in this category, but I would, I would argue it's not exactly necessarily a great thing. Um, he's, he's relatively hypermobile as an athlete and he's falling down the mound and a guy scoring this high when it comes to his actual knee extension velocity, I, I would, I would argue is, is potentially exposing him to a potential knee injury if we don't create some more stability in his lower half, um, when, when everything's moving slow, as, except for the, the knee extension, um, I, I expect a lot of, of stress to, to hit that tissue. And, and it's something that honestly, when we address some of the other things, when it comes to his torso and his pelvis, I would expect this number to, to drop um, pretty substantially, actually. And that's why I think it's important in biomechanics not to, not to stare at this page and go, okay, I need everything to be green. Because in this case, and I think I've already alluded to this, is if, if something's green, it might actually mean something um, negative. So um, it's more about like, where do we where do we want to move fast? And in, th in this athlete's case, with a high rotational capacity, I'd like to see um, higher scores when it comes to his torso. I'd like to see higher scores when it comes to his pelvis velocities. So the fourth and final objective that I'm going to cover with this athlete um, is, is, that, is actual kinematic sequencing. Um, this is kind of a recurring theme here, and we dive a little bit more granular here. Um, each one of these individual lines are, are individual pitches. So if you can appreciate um, a little bit of variability when it comes to the way this athlete's moving. Um, if, you, if you notice here, and this is something that we, we highlighted on the very first slide, but kinematically, his torso is peaking in velocity relatively consistently prior to his pelvis. Okay, These two lines here the exact same event time okay and you can notice the torso slide or the torso side is actually peaking relatively consistently prior to the pelvis so if you can appreciate the fact that his chest is rotating prior to his pelvis rotating and this is a these are velocity peaks these aren't position peaks so if you keep in mind like it, it, kinematically if we're transferring energy from the ground up it, it doesn't necessarily make sense for an athlete to to peak in their upper half prior to their lower half. Um, additionally, we, we wanted to reiterate the fact that he's relatively low scoring in, in hip shoulder separation. Um, and this is something that we feel he can, he can exponentially improve um, really, really quickly, honestly. I think part of this is just neurologically being aware of the objectives and understanding why. And um, the, the drill selection uh, is executed with a little bit more tenacity whenever the athletes have this picture so if you can appreciate this everything up to this point we've just kind of been painting a picture and um, in my experience I've, I've seen a lot of motion capture reports that kind of end here they spend a lot of time discussing 
you know, what an athlete's doing poorly or where their holes are. Um, we spend as much time talking about the actual action items as we do um, the deficiencies. So we've we spent enough time beating this athlete up. Now it's time to bring him up and give him the plan and, and walk him through the path to, to improve. So now I'm going to dive into the recommendations. This first tab is more of an overview. Um, this, I'm going to sound like a broken record here, and hopefully I am because I think that the if everything's pointing to the same same place, we're, we're on to something. So this athlete's case, um, from a range of motion standpoint, he's got a ton of laxity and stiffness in the right places that's it's going to allow us to make strides relatively quickly. It's going to take some hard intentional work on this athlete's part, um, but we want to highlight the fact that there is a path to improve. Um, we need to, this athlete to make the weight room a big priority. This will be the most important aspect in his development currently. It's probably going to be his best pitching coach at this point. Um, not, not saying that, that we can't dive um, into the weeds when it comes to the actual mechanical interventions, and we will do so, but if, if he's not strong, our strides that we're going to be able to make on the pitching side are going to be relatively limited. Um, and this is something that the athletes probably grasped at this point, but we're going to reiterate the fact that we want to teach this athlete to sequence properly and, and rotate a little bit more, um, create a little bit more separation between his lower and his upper half. Now, as far as the uh, the actual objectives go, I, I like to give guys delivery cues, and these are these are generally external focus cues. Just because when it comes to motor learning, external cues are going to win every single time. So it's one thing for me to sit up here and and say, you know what, like your your hip hip shoulder separation is bad. I need you to I need you to rotate 20 degrees. I need you to do all these super super technical um, biomechanical things. And it's another altogether for me to understand the cue that's going to resonate with the athlete to get him into the positions subconsciously. So in this athlete's case, when he plays catch, I want him thinking about gluing his heel to the rubber. So keeping that right heel down on the rubber a little bit longer. Um, I want him to think about extending his glove side towards third base. And I want him to visualize pitching like a merry-go-round, so more rotational, as opposed to a Ferris wheel. So neurally just kind of reiterating the the objectives now from here on out we're going to be covering his, his like pre-throw routine that we're, we're generating based on um, the movement that we're trying to chase so this athlete's case he's relatively flat through his thoracic spine so his upper back he's really flat so we're trying to create a little bit more of a upper back kyphosis a little bit of core control there's going to be a, a coordination and a proprioceptive benefit for this athlete making a lot of ground contact um, so the cues I want him to keep in mind with this exercise are to press away from the ground because if he's not pressing with tension, his upper back's going to be concave. If you, if your athletes are doing a bear crawl and it looks like you could drink soup out of their upper back, um, you need to tell them to press away from the ground. And I want his hand and his foot striking the ground simultaneously. Second pre-throw drill is to encourage rotation right out the gate. So this is something that we feel the, the med ball is more of like a general um, physical exercise that's going to allow him to, number one, feel a little bit of a coil into that lower half. I want him to think about riding the slide. I want him to think about gripping the ground with his right foot. I'm just trying to encourage stability on this on this right leg. Um, the third one, if you guys can appreciate um, the way that the, the front side mechanics worked on our big league example, he had a lot more of a, a counterbalanced front leg. Again, that's something that when we're evaluating our ER, our ER guys and our data set, the vast majority of them do a really good job of, of creating um, a lot of a counterbalance, whether it be in their in their upper back and their T-spine with their glove work, but as well as their lower half when it comes to their front side mechanics. So this exercise is going to do a couple of things. It's going to allow him, number one, to feel that front leg get away from him a little bit. It's also going to allow him to feel his hip um, load a little bit more effectively. And then if we're setting him up for success with the way he's starting this exercise, um, I, he honestly, from this point on, should just be trying to like blow it up, trying to knock the wall down and letting his body organize into the range that he already possesses. Now we're going to dive into a little bit of a plyo routine here. Um, this is a step back plyo throw. So if you guys can appreciate the entire motion capture report, I've been talking about how this athlete was just falling forward. So this exercise is as simple as just getting him to kind of um, overcorrect in the opposite manner. So I'd like him to get into his back hip, 
Um, additionally, if you guys can think back to, I think it was the second slide when we discussed his stride length, the athlete scored really, really high in, our, in, in the stride length category. And I think that has a lot to do with him falling. So if we can get this athlete to step backwards, we're encouraging him to use the actual hip abduction that he possesses. So I'm hoping subconsciously that his front foot's going to get down a little bit earlier. So, and again, I just want to encourage him um, to counter rotate. So keeping that, that glove side a little bit more towards, uh, towards third base when he's doing this exercise. Next exercise here is, is called a, a drop step plyo throw. And this is one where I literally don't want him to have any kind of like internal thought whatsoever. I want him to set up facing away from the wall and I want him to see how athletic he can be. The only thing I really care about here when it comes to his plyo throw is that he's staying high and his high into his arm side. Um, if you see athletes that are, you know, within 10 feet of a wall, throwing the ball right in the center of their body, right in their midline, um, more times than not, they're encouraging like a, a very cutting uh, dynamic when it comes to the ball in their hand. Um, I just want to move in like an athlete here and tapping into some rotation. If you can appreciate when, when Riley's doing this drill, if you watch his front side mechanics, that left leg will actually straighten out on him and give him that element of counterbalance. So that, that ER bias move that we want to encourage. So biggest thing I can tell you guys is that if, if we understand granularly how the athlete moves passively and then we evaluate the actual, the actual movements involved, we can get deep into the weeds, but then it comes down to something very, very digestible and simple. So in this athlete's case, he understands why he's doing these drills. And then it's as simple as consistently doing these drills on a regular basis, us monitoring the actual delivery changes and checking in with the athlete when it comes to the mechanics and tracking them long term. Now, this is also the next time we see this athlete is it's going to be June um, in person. We, we keep in touch um, via a distance model right now. But uh, when he comes back in June, I'm expecting to see a lot better rotational velocities. I'm expecting him to be um, a little bit more stacked over the rubber and, and hopefully throwing harder. So if you guys have any questions regarding this process, please feel free to email us at csbflorida at gmail.com. Um, message me on Twitter, Instagram, whatever. I, this is something that's been a game changer for us. This is something that um, the more folks that we've, we've ran through, the, the larger our data sets become. Um, easier it's been to create these these plans for athletes and this is honestly something that um, we feel is is very very vital to to our success with pitchers down here at csp so thanks for your time guys